So before we get started, I'm going to need to warn all of you that we're going to be talking about a horrific mass shooting and attempted genocide against the transgender community currently ongoing here in the United States and other countries and the intersection of these two disgusting events. If that's not a topic that you can handle right now, it's 100% okay to step away. I'm not even sure if it's something I can handle right now, nor should anyone be asked to. But especially if you are not transgender, I urge you to please watch this video because I think it is vital, especially right now. Also, I do apologize. I often try to find a bit of humor or levity in my videos. Sadly, I didn't have the energy or the ability to do that this time. I barely have the energy to have written and now perform this, and I'm honestly kind of dreading editing this over the next couple of days. With that being said, let's start with the facts that we know. I should say that I am writing about an evolving situation, so I may be behind on the most up-to-date information, but on Monday, March 27th, 2023, in Nashville, Tennessee, in the United States, a 28-year-old person entered the private convent Christian school with at least two assault rifles and a handgun and killed six individuals, three of them being nine-year-old students, and the other three being adult staff members, before this person was finally stopped and killed by the police. The victims' names were Evelyn Dickhouse, Hallie Scruggs, William Kinney, Catherine Kuntz, Cynthia Peak, and Mike Hill. Later, it was reported that the shooter was a former student of the school as a child, and this information is based on the recollection of Bill Campbell, the school's headmaster from 2004 to 2008. A manifesto was found at the shooter's home that is still currently being analyzed, but shows that there was at least some level of premeditation behind the shooting, though we don't know if there were intended targets by the shooter, with police last statement, again, as of this recording, being that they believed that the victims themselves may have been random, if not the school itself. You may have noticed that during all of that that I have not used the shooter's name. This is for two reasons. The first of which is that the name that the shooter used is currently in question due to the fact that the shooter was trans. However, the second, bigger reason is the one that I have articulated before about mass shootings and those who perpetrate them. I personally have no desire to remember or say the name of people who commit mass shootings. Regardless of this person's identity and motives, those who take guns and murder children, I have no want to have their names expressly in my videos. At least unless absolutely necessary. If you wish to know the shooter's name, it is out there for you, but for me personally, I hold the standard for all mass shooters, and it's something that I've expressed in past videos about other mass shooters that have occurred. We will get into more nuance about this in just a little bit, but I want to make it very clear that this person's actions are horrific and awful. This person's actions pain me to even think about. They hurt me deeply, as every mass shooting hurts me to hear about. And the fact that there are so many hurts in and of itself. I am devastated for those who have died, especially for the three children. Their deaths leave an irreparable hole that is directly the responsibility of this shooter. Unfortunately, the reason I have to be so expressly clear and upfront about that is if I don't, there will be disingenuous folks who will assume differently and would take the lack of clarity on my part to disingenuously paint my intents and beliefs for reasons that I will discuss in just a little bit. So know my exact feelings up front. Fuck this person and their actions. But this gets to my next point, the fact that I mentioned that the shooter was trans. Several of the shooter's social media accounts, like LinkedIn and Instagram, show that the shooter used he-him pronouns while also being assigned female at birth, alongside using a more masculine-sounding name than the one that was given to them at birth. Yet, to be clear, as of this recording, the shooter's gender identity is not known to have been a factor in the shooter's motivations. This lack of confirmation, however, has not sadly stopped narratives from forming around this person that are intersecting with ongoing anti-trans rhetorics being espoused in the United States, linking this person's horrific act of violence to their trans identity. Take this statement, for example, that was done by one conservative commentator with over 680,000 followers. We will not let this story be swept under the rug. Trans terrorism must be confronted head on and stopped. This tweet, by the way, was made before the shooter's trans identity was 100% confirmed by news outlets, showcasing this account's willingness, along with many others, to jump on the narrative without factual confirmation. But moving on, take Tucker Carlson on Fox News the night after the shooting, also expressing a similar 
thought. In Canada, a taxpayer-funded trans rights organization put out a statement that ignored the murder of the children in Nashville entirely and instead claimed there has been a, quote, exponential rise in anti-trans violence. That is a lie. It's a provable lie. And in fact, the opposite is true. We seem to be watching the rise of trans terrorism. The man who tried to murder Supreme Court Justice Brett Kavanaugh after the repeal of Roe v. Wade identified as a, quote, trans gamer girl. The man who shot up a nightclub in Colorado in this past November and murdered five people identified as non-binary. And now this. And there could be more. And Tifa has announced this coming Saturday is the, quote, trans day of vengeance. Vengeance for what? That's not explained. But the suggestion is there will be violence in Washington this weekend. The idea being espoused here and by many others in anti-trans spaces is not about the potential motive of the shooter being linked to the shooter's gender, such as if the shooter was the victim of discrimination for being trans leading to their decision to do the shooting. No, simply the fact that the shooter was trans is what is being linked with the cause of their violence in and of itself by Tucker Carlson and others. We can see this linking further in tweets like these. When will we start talking about transgender mass murderers targeting innocent children in our schools? Enough is enough. The Colorado Springs shooter identified as non-binary. The Denver shooter identified as trans. The Aberdeen shooter identified as trans. The Nashville shooter identified as trans. One thing is very clear. The modern trans movement is radicalizing activists into terrorists. These tweets, the second of which was commented on by Elon Musk, the former richest man in the world, are trying to link the idea here that these mass shootings are all part of a chain and trend of intentional acts of terror being caused by trans people, and inherently being related to the fact that they are trans. And these folks are by no means exclusive in this type of linking. The New York Post, which is owned by Fox News owner Rupert Murdoch, also prominently displayed the killer's trans identity on its front page on Tuesday. This way indirectly linking the shooter's trans identity with their violent act. Tucker Carlson also echoed this again in his broadcast, building upon that fact with the idea that a Christian school was targeted. Trans ideology claims dominion over nature itself. We can change the identity we were born with, they will tell you with wild-eyed certainty. Christians can never agree with this statement because these are powers they believe God alone possesses. That unwillingness to agree, that failure to acknowledge a trans person's dominion over nature, incites and enrages some in the trans community. People who believe they're God can't stand to be reminded that they're not. So Christianity and transgender orthodoxy are wholly incompatible theologies. They can never be reconciled. They are on a collision course with each other. One side is likely to draw blood before the other side. That's what we concluded last week. Tucker Carlson, along with many others, are framing the entirety of trans people as the enemy of Christianity and God himself based on the actions of one trans person. There are a few things to go over with all of this. Firstly, there's a lot of disinformation here. Most obviously to point out, the Colorado Springs shooter was not non-binary. The Colorado Springs shooter's lawyer did attempt briefly to claim that the shooter was non-binary, but has since retracted that. Second, the Aberdeen and Denver shootings were not terrorist acts. Terrorist acts are acts that are done in pursuit of political aims. The Denver shooting, of which only one of two shooters was trans, was claimed to have been caused by the bullying the two shooters had received, which is a common excuse evoked by school shooters throughout the decades, not just by shooters who happen to be trans. The Aberdeen shooting was also a workplace shooting, not a school shooting, and the shooter's motivations we will come back to in a little bit. But to be very clear, it was not one with a political intent. On top of all of this, Tucker Carlson and others claim that the Nashville shooting was also a terrorist act, and they attempt to prop up this narrative using further disinformation, like claiming that this photo is of the shooter, which it is not. None of these are exclusive to the events in Nashville. In fact, after many other shootings, there have been attempts to use photos of completely different people to try to claim that the mass shooter was trans. The only difference in this case is that this shooter actually was. Again, while we don't know the motivations for the Nashville shooting as of yet, more than likely it was not an attempt to kill Christians for the fact that they are Christians, or Tennesseans for their recent anti-trans legislations, as these tweets claimed were the case, which were tweeted before we knew anything about the killer's motivations, which again, at the time of this video, we still don't know. Nor was it because something about them being trans made them inherently violent. The second issue with these narratives is the claim that there is a trend of trans people causing mass 
shootings and acts of terror. This, of course, ignores the fact that trans people are less likely to be the perpetrators of mass shootings and more likely to be the victims of them. Of the 2,829 mass shootings that have taken place in the last five years in the United States, trans people have only been involved in three of them. If you do the math based on even the most conservative estimation of the trans population in the United States, cisgender individuals are around 4.6 times more likely to commit mass shootings than trans people are. So the idea that there is a trend of trans people committing mass shootings is demonstrably false. However, the goal of all of these claims is intentional disinformation, however, framing trans people as disproportionately more violent by the nature of being transgender. And it's quite evident in its attempt to vilify transgender people to be able to bolster the currently ongoing anti-transgender rhetorics in the United States. There have been constant attempts, especially over the last few years, to frame transgender people as inherently dangerous to children, groomers, and pedophiles just by nature of us being trans. Our bodies and existence are seen as inherently sexual, which you can often see in how many anti-trans talking points talk about us. It's not even that you have to affirm his self-perception. As twisted as that would be on its own, it's actually that you must participate in this man's fetish. Okay, he gets turned on by the, by, by the idea of himself as a woman, and, and even more so if you uh, participate in that charade, and so you have to participate. Because he has a right to act out his depraved fetish um, in public and with your participation. That's what the women are being told. However, this idea has attempted to be codified directly into anti-trans legislations in the United States, as exemplified by Arkansas Bill SB 270. This bill, if passed, would charge trans adults with sex crimes simply for entering into a bathroom that also happens to have an 18-year-old in it. Something that, you know, happens all the time in your local Starbucks. There didn't used to be a problem. I, I grew up in a world where boys used the boys' bathroom, girls used the girls' bathroom, and for the most part, everybody looked the part. Because we've tried to make accommodations in recent years to allow people to transition from one sex to the other, then we created this problem. You're talking about someone merely existing. You're not talking about even an option where someone would use a stall. I mean, the way this is written, someone could be in a shower with the curtain shut, and because someone else came in and knew that person was trans, they can seek to prosecute them. If this is truly about protecting children from folks who are looking for sexual gratification, then why not just make an amendment that makes that very clear like Mr. Jennings suggested? Language could be very easily added that made that clear that that's what we're doing here. But as the bill stands now, the language of the bill, not your intent, but as the bill stands now, it targets trans people. This bill will not prevent sexual assaults that are happening in bathrooms by trans people because there aren't sexual assaults happening in bathrooms by trans people. Like quite literally today, I went out to get coffee this morning and went to the bathroom and there was also a kid who was entering the bathroom as I was leaving it. In Arkansas, if this bill passed, which by the way, it passed the Arkansas Senate on March 28th, the day after the shooting, I would have been charged with a sex crime for peeing at my local coffee shop simply by virtue of being trans. Our existence is seen in these legislations as sexual. And despite countless evidence showing that trans-affirming care being given to transgender kids saves lives over and over and over again, such care is being constantly vilified in right-wing talking points and continually legislated against and vilified as grooming and transing the children. And are put on a conveyor belt of off-label puberty blockers, synthetic hormones, and even life-altering surgeries. But instead of caring for the child's underlying distress, the science shows this conveyor belt leads to more pain. The full risks are not yet known, but what we do know is enough to pull the plug on this entire political experiment. This is not healthcare. These are dangerous unscientific and unregulated experiments with permanent effects, and they're being perpetrated by ideologues and activists on our children. Children are not political experiments.
Further, this anti-trans rhetoric surrounding the shooter is also being used to further the claim that trans people are dangerous to Western civilization generally, with Western civilization being related to Judeo-Christian values exemplified by Tucker Carlson's earlier clip. Why are some trans people so angry, and why do they seem to be mad specifically at traditional Christians? We can't think of any trans person who's ever been murdered by a pastor. As far as we know, that has never happened. So it's not an actual threat of violence from Christians that's inspiring some trans people to buy AR-15s. No, it's, it's got to be more fundamental than that. And it is. The trans movement is the mirror image of Christianity, and therefore its natural enemy. Yesterday's massacre did not happen because of lax gun laws. Yesterday's massacre happened because of a deranged and demonic ideology that is infecting this country with the encouragement of people like Joe Biden. Also jumping up that clip, Tucker lies even further to frame that it's only trans people as even being capable of violence like this. He, for example, said that no pastor has ever killed a trans person. This is demonstrably false. The numerous gay and trans conversion therapy claims that are actively being pushed by many pastors in this country and many others is active harm to trans people. But there have been quite literal murder cases like this one, which took a simple Google search to find. And by the way, this does not mean that all Christians and pastors are evil. I know many wonderful Christians and pastors, including some in my own family, and yes, I have pastors in my own family, who are amazing and trans supportive. Yet, apparently, all trans people are exemplified by this one trans shooter. These vilification narratives around the trans community are all part of an attempt to justify the currently ongoing genocide attempt currently happening in the United States against trans people. If that is something that does seem hyperbolic to you, number one, I will point you to my fellow creator Vera Wilde's amazing video that goes into the precise technical legal definitions of genocide and how that correlates with what is currently going on in the United States just this year. The intended audience for this video are people who have no open hostility towards the trans community, but who may think that trans activists are kind of going overboard with how they talk about just a couple of laws in a few places. If you already consider yourself an ally, or you yourself are trans, you may also find this video helpful in terms of using the information that is within it to help you better articulate to others what it is that has been going on. I'm going to do my best to talk simply and plainly. I do not intend to raise my voice. I hope to avoid hypotheticals and what-if scenarios. I'm not going to get into the recently gained insight about who is forming these laws and how they have been going about it. And I do not intend to single out any specific individuals by name, be they politicians, public figures, or other creators. It is my hope to deal with very simple facts that should not be in dispute. If you are watching my video the day it goes live, Vera's video will go live tomorrow. So to give a quick example, take the over 400 anti-trans bills in the United States currently being considered. You can also take Michael Knowles, who on the stage of CPAC, one of the biggest political events in the United States, calling for eliminating transgenderism. If it is false, then for the good of society, and especially for the good of the poor people who have fallen prey to this confusion, Transgenderism must be eradicated from public life entirely. The whole preposterous ideology at every level. Here he frames being transgender as an ideology by using the term transgenderism, which is not the case. Transgender people are a group of people that exist. We are not an ideology. And to frame us as such is quite literally dehumanizing and using it as an attempt to hide the fact that this is calling for a genocide of trans people. You can also take the former president of the United States, one of the most powerful positions in the world, and current presidential hopeful Donald Trump, as well as other potential presidential hopeful Ron DeSantis, calling for anti-trans legislations in their platforms. I will sign a new executive order instructing every federal agency to cease all programs that promote the concept of sex and gender transition at any age. I will then ask Congress to permanently stop federal taxpayer dollars from being used to promote or pay for these procedures and pass a law prohibiting child sexual mutilation in all 50 states. It'll go very quickly. I will declare that any hospital or healthcare provider that participates in the chemical or physical mutilation of minor youth will no longer meet federal health and safety standards for Medicaid and Medicare, 
and will be terminated from the program immediately. For or, if you just want to be quite direct about it, you can take the very clear and stark example of how the definition of genocide includes, quote, forcibly transferring children of the group to another group, and how many states currently are trying to pass bills that would remove trans kids from trans-affirming parents. Like, what are some of those thoughts that go through your mind? Wow, what if they took away, what if they took me away from mom? What if, what if they arrested mom? What if they took me somewhere? What if they forced me to be somebody who I wasn't? Mm -hmm. I always have these thoughts moving through my head. Like, what if this happens? Should I do this? Should I jump out the window? Has that sort of escalated in the last few days? It's not been, it's been getting a bit worse, but whenever I need it, some help or anything, I would let one of my friends know, like Sky, or let my mom know, and we would chat. Um, which is my mom's helpful. been with me my whole life. I wouldn't have made it without her. I literally can't get more specific than that when saying, look, a genocide attempt is occurring. And there are many more examples, and again, I will point you to Vera's amazing video on it. But it's gross and disgusting what is happening in the United States right now. And by the way, these are not isolated incidents, but coordinated movements by political groups. A recent leak of over 26,000 emails that was reported on by Mother Jones showcases how anti-trans legislation is drafted behind the scenes. And we can see that despite the fact that many of these politicians and pundits claim that science is being used to justify these legislations, they are actually often more the direct result of political calculations and religious motivations. You can even quite clearly see it in clips like this one. The thing in, in 2019, there was three things that won us the election. It was nothing to do with me. Uh, it, was, it was Brexit, it was Boris, it was Corbyn. Mm -hmm. And it was as simple as that. Those three things together was a great campaign. Mm -hmm. Great ingredients. Mm -hmm. um, at the next election, we haven't got those three things. So mm -hmm. we're going to have to mm -hmm. think of something else. It'll probably be a, cult, uh, a mixture of culture wars and trans debate. That was a politician in the UK, which is also having similar anti trans legislations going on right now, quite literally saying the quiet part out loud. That legislating against trans people is not out of some moral duty to protect trans people or to protect children or kids. It's out of a quite literal desire to push up their political platform. Even further, anti-trans rhetoric and movements are often used to justify pushes for totalitarian and authoritarian movements, and we're seeing this currently going on worldwide. I highly recommend this article by Judith Butler that goes into that in more specifics. As a fascist trend, the anti-gender movement supports ever-strengthening forms of authoritarianism. Its tactics encourage state powers to intervene in university programs, to censor art and television programs, to forbid trans people their legal rights, to ban LGBTQI people from public spaces, to undermine reproductive freedom, and the struggle against violence directed at women, children, and LGBTQI people. It threatens violence against those, including migrants, who have become cast as demonic forces and whose suppression or expulsion promises to restore a national order under duress. The goal, though, of these anti-trans rhetorics is quite literally a political calculus, used often by far-right spaces and political groups to use trans people as a scapegoat and argue that we are needing of elimination to protect the women and children, and that you need to elect an authoritarian or totalitarian in order to get that done. This brings us back to the Nashville shooter. The act of horrific violence by this one trans person is being used to frame all trans people as a whole as being part of a more extensive trend of trans violence, despite all evidence to the contrary. Sadly, this isn't new, but just the latest, most horrific example. Anti-trans news sites like Fox News or The Daily Wire love to talk about the supposed crimes of trans people, such as framing trans women as allegedly being more likely to be violent, more specifically sexually violent, which is not true. Numerous statistics have shown that trans women are more likely to be the targets of sexual violence. Sadly though, even beyond the past few years, this framing of a marginalized group as the root of all violence is not a new tactic in fascistic movements used to bolster authoritarianism. Take for example the 1930s anti-Semitic paper Der Stuttmer. While the paper was not owned by the Nazis, Der Stuttmer was so popular in Germany in the 1930s within the Nazi party that Hitler himself encouraged its distribution throughout Germany. So much so that copies of the paper were displayed in town square for people to read who weren't subscribed to it. The paper constantly hammered home the idea to readers that Jews were to blame for all the problems in German society. 
Readers were told that despite what they may have personally experienced in good interactions with Jewish people in their daily lives, that nonetheless there was something wrong with these people, and that they were constantly plotting to undermine and subvert German society. The Jewish question, a phrase which is very similar to the phrase the trans question, which is often used by right-wing folks today, constantly popped up in the magazine, framing Jewish people as not being human beings, but an ideology that could be eliminated from public life. Going further, Der Stumner cheered on Hitler's final solution, arguing that Jewish people were predisposed towards evil and thus deserving to be murdered. The link between the paper's rhetoric and the genocide of the Holocaust was so clear and evident that Der Sturnum's editor, Julius Streicher, was considered a part of the cause of the Holocaust and was convicted of inciting genocide at the Nuremberg Trials and was executed in 1946. All of this is not even to mention, by the way, that trans people ourselves were part of the Holocaust the Nazis caused. As I've discussed in numerous videos, one of the first acts by Nazis was the destruction of the Institute of Sexology, a trans and LGBTQ research center run by a gay Jewish man. Not to mention the many trans and LGBTQ people who were forced to wear pink stars in Nazi concentration camps, as they were also being genocided along with Jewish folks including many LGBTQ Jewish people. We see this act of violence by the Nashville shooter being used similarly to justify further pushes for the dehumanization and genocide of trans people and continued anti-trans legislation. Police admit that this was a targeted attack on Christians by a demonic t Gender affirming care should be completely banned after this mass shooting today. T is the final straw. This cannot continue. How much hormones like testosterone and medications for mental illness was the transgender Nashville school shooter taking? Everyone can stop blaming guns now. That last tweet was quite literally done by Marjorie Taylor Greene, a currently sitting U.S. Congresswoman. It's a blatantly stupid tweet, falsely claiming with no evidence that testosterone is the cause of more violence, and also trying to frame the only reason for mass shootings being testosterone and not numerous other factors, not the least of which is the fact that people have access to guns in the first place, something that Marjorie Taylor Greene is attempting to downplay. If Marjorie Taylor Greene and many of these anti-trans campaigners actually cared about protecting children as they claim, they would be passing gun reform laws, as gun deaths are the leading cause of death in the United States or children, not drag queens or trans ideology as they so claim. Or if she really cared about kids, she'd fight the anti-trans legislations that are targeting trans kids' health care. Or she'd fight bills that target trans youth that have a demonstrable effect on trans kids' mental health. Yet these anti-trans narratives also serve another function for authoritarian movements beyond dehumanizing and scapegoating the transgender population as inherently violent. They are meant to be used to victim blame trans people as well as to vilify us for fighting back against the current genocide attempt against us. Currently, many trans people do realize that we are in a genocide attempt. And sadly, many, myself included, recognize that while we desperately, desperately wish that we could solve this issue with nonviolence, that are people that are attempting to kill us are willing to use violence against us. And thus, we need to defend ourselves and fight back against that. Because people are dying and being irreparably traumatized, and it is continuing to be pushed further upon more people in more ways. As we are currently seeing with the continued rash of anti-transgender legislations continually being put up that are pushing anti-trans points further and further. It is very clear to many trans people that the need to push back against people trying to harm the transgender community, especially active fascists who are trying to harm the transgender community, is now. And we're seeing this start to happen. I recently did a video where I discussed neo-Nazis who came to an anti-trans rally in Australia and discussed the link between fascism and anti-trans rhetorics. I also did a follow-up video to that video earlier this week about how many trans people and our allies over the next few days in Australia and New Zealand fought back against the fascist anti-trans rhetoric and Kelly J. Keen Minchel, the anti-trans leader who is often working with far-right groups like the neo-Nazis to push her anti-trans rhetoric and to call for even more anti-trans violence being caused against the trans community. All of this led to a huge counter-protest against her and specifically to Kelly J. Keen Minchel getting tomato juice thrown in her face. And all of this proved to work. Number one, the tomato juice to her face embarrassed her, as Nazis and far-right groups are all about the aesthetic of power, wanting to seem and appear powerful. And so seeing tomato juice being thrown on her is seen as an embarrassment that makes them seem useless and impotent. On top of this, due to the counter-protesters, her rallies throughout New Zealand were soon cancelled after that. Do you think it'd be worse in Wellington? Yeah. 
Yeah. Maybe it's uh, maybe it's time to. I think so. Say that we say can't, we can't, can't do it. Can't protect you. No. Okay. Against hundreds of thousands of people. No. Okay. This situation with the tomato juice echoes a similar one that happened with Anita Bryant, an anti-gay advocate in the United States whose movement lost steam after she was pied in the face, which highlighted how silly and ridiculous her points were. Because bigotry is silly and dumb, just sadly given legitimacy. And tomato juice to someone's hair or pies to the face often showcase how silly that bigotry is, and it just underscores the truth of it. Every oh, oh, oh. Embarrassment and humiliation are useful tools to utilize alongside pushing back to show how stupid and silly those trying to harm minorities are. You can see a clear example of the power of standing up and the power of embarrassment used together at this moment when an amazing trans youth stood up to the anti-trans bill in Texas, SB888, at a Texas House Representative meeting on Wednesday, then used humor to underscore their own strength and power in their statements and those in positions of power's true stupidity and weakness. When they represent such a small portion of our population, um, when we have really big issues in this state. Um, I'm a third grade teacher and our schools lack adequate funding right now. Um, we are suffering from so many different things in this state and to be focusing on something that would very specifically harm transgender kids when they represent such a small portion of our population. As a Texan, it just really hurts my heart to see and so I just came here to say that. Okay, so uh, Vice Chair Johnson. Agreed. Well said. Thank you for coming. Thank you, Representative. Appreciate your time. All right. Thank you. Is there a Connie Lingus here? What about Anita Dick and me? <laughs> or Holden, Holden Middick? Okay. Are any three of those people here? All right. You got your, you got your, you got your moment. I hope you enjoy it. I hope that gave you a laugh because, dear heavens, we deserve to laugh at these people. So, throwing tomato juice in someone's hair or pieing someone in the face is quite often an effective tactic against Nazis and fascism and hate. And while I do not love or revel in the fact that tomato juice was thrown in Kelly J. Keene Mitchell's face, it is a small act compared to the pain that she has caused and actively reveled in herself and cheered on against the trans community. On top of this, there were actually two trans supporter people who were actively attacked at those counter-protests. Yet, yeah, despite this, despite the fact that trans people were just defending against literal fascists trying to push anti-trans rhetoric in places like New Zealand, trans people at these events and our allies were vilified as the bullies. Indeed, the Guardian and the BBC both referred to as that over the weekend uh, when you got uh, attacked by trans activists. Now, you're not anti-trans, you're pro-women and girls, aren't you? Um, I'm not entirely yeah. sure that the trans activists are pro-trans, even though it was. Talk, let, talk, talk us through, <laughs> I mean, you had problems in Australia as well, uh, with some violence, uh, protests and intimidatory behaviour. Talk us through what happened in New Zealand. We've got some footage of you being attacked with, um, I mean, really quite aggressive um, activists, yeah. um, but also a can of soup being thrown over you. Bearing in mind, you're about five foot, I mean, you're tiny, aren't you? You're a five foot mm. woman. Um, yes, and you're speaking. You're not. You're not attacking anybody. You're not. You're not hurting anybody. You're just no. speaking with your with your with your microphone. Many in media kept calling these counter protests active harm. But even beyond the anti-trans talking points, there are many people who were trans supportive who seemed to balk at events like this. That we should be non-violent in the face of violence being done against us. I don't agree with the soup thing. What goes around comes around, and it may become a method or acceptable action to be taken by the other side against trans people and their allies. Great that the people are motivated to peacefully support their allies in such numbers. A call for civility to say, well, we should just debate them in the marketplace of ideas or do nonviolent protests against them. I certainly very much understand where these comments come from. In fact, just a few years ago, I very much would have echoed them. They come from a understandable place of not wishing any violence to have to occur and being upset at seeing violence happen. And the sometimes sweet, earnest, and somewhat innocent belief that the right cause can win without violence. 
And while I definitely think that nonviolence has its place in movements like this, and I think we should try to use it as a first tactic, it is sadly at the point where that may not be continually able to be the case. But we must remember that events like Stonewall, which sparked the modern LGBTQ rights movement, was itself a violent riot against state power. Sometimes you need to throw a brick at people who are willing to do more violence against you and your body. World War II itself was a war against fascism that was only won through violence. Violence is not something to be sought or desired, but fighting fascism is. While fascism and authoritarianism often gets to hide its violence through the utilization of state power, scapegoats, and stochastic terrorism, trans people and other marginalized groups who are harmed are often doing self-defense for ourselves quite publicly. And to be very clear, I am not sitting here being like, yay, I'm very excited about that fact. We also need to be honest about it. Sometimes beating fascism cannot be done or stopped nonviolently. And it's important to note that when people are doing that, it is not because they themselves are violent or hateful. They are doing it out of self-defense. Trans people pushing back against fascists calling for our genocide through state violence are being self-defensive. We are not the ones instigating the violence. Trans people though, despite being the ones that are being self-defensive, not the ones stoking violence, are the ones that are vilified as the aggressors and terrorists especially by those who don't wish to recognize the utilization of systemic power to cause a genocide against trans people, or who even acknowledge that trans people are a people, not an ideology. Yet even for people who do recognize trans people as full human beings, we are sometimes argued that we're just as bad as the far right, saying that the far right and trans people are just as bad as each other because they have fallen into this false framing of trans people's existence as being on the opposite end of anti-trans legislation and people trying to talk about trans ideology. These two things are not opposed to each other. These are not dichotomy. Trans people defending ourselves are not just on the opposite end of the spectrum of the far right. We are just trying to exist and live our lives. To be clear, racism, anti-Semitism, anti-trans hate, and more interlocking bigotries are not legitimate points of view that just need to be debated in the marketplaces of ideas, but need to be thrown out as quick as possible because they lead quite directly to violence. And it's also important to note that the violence that we often enact in self-defense is usually at a much lower level than those stoking the violence. While Kelly Jane Keen Mitchell just gets tomato juice to her hair, she is often called and cheered on active physical violence against trans people, for example. Nor are trans people wielding state power, because we don't have any, to justify a genocide against an entire group of people, including children. So no, these things aren't just as bad as each other, but they're often framed that way because we legitimize these viewpoints as legitimate in and of themselves. And because we have so vilified trans people as being the ones that are actively violent, when a single trans person does enact a horrific act of violence against the innocent, as the Nashville shooter did, all trans people are seen as the same, fit into the narrative of trans terrorists. Trans terrorism should be a cause of concern for those of us who oppose the trans movement, not for trans people themselves. And even aside from that, the narcissism is once again the point. Always points back to that. This is a movement of self-worship and self-obsession, a movement full of people who cannot see beyond themselves, people who cannot see the rest of the world, do not acknowledge the existence really of other human beings because they're constantly staring in the mirror, even if it is uh, oftentimes more of a funhouse mirror. Constantly staring back into their own egos, obsessed with their own emotions and their own need for affirmation. That is what we learn here. Though it is a lesson that we have already learned many times. The Nashville shooter is just seen as the latest example of something that all trans people are involved in. And this narrative of trans people being bullies continues when we stand up for our rights and fight the system that harms us all, with people using events like Nashville to victim blame continually. You can hear this quite clearly in folks like Matt Walsh saying trans people are narcissistic for being concerned at the anti-trans hate being spewed under the veil of the Nashville shooter rhetoric. Six innocent people were massacred, and the first thought the first thought, the first thing that he thought about, uh, the first thing this trans activist thought about was how this would affect him. His very first thought was concern for himself. After hearing that three children and three school uh, staff members were murdered. Forget about the fact that the fears make no sense. Okay, Trans terrorism should be a cause of concern for those of us who oppose the trans movement, not for trans people themselves. 
This showcases men like Matt Walsh's cruelty of how when trans people are refused the ability and time to mourn the dead from the shooting like others get to do because we are currently being under attack and understand that, we are then blamed for being worried about ourselves as narcissists. We are then victim blamed for not caring about the deaths as right-wing rhetoric grows around us. Believe me, every trans person cares about those deaths, cares about those kids who died. And yet we aren't allowed time to feel and express that, and that is abjectly, disgustingly cruel. But you can see this victim blaming more systemically, as when a group of teenagers and parents went to the Tennessee Capitol in protest for more gun regulations, the right claimed that it was a trans activist mob who are trying to commit an insurrection, demanding trans rights, who have no empathy for the six people killed in Nashville. Trans activist mob stormed Tennessee State Capitol demanding trans rights. No empathy for the six people killed in Nashville. When Joe Biden delivered his Soul of the Nation speech, he said MAGA was a threat to this country. Trans activists had now slaughtered Christians in a mass shooting and staged an insurrection at the Tennessee Capitol all in a matter of days. Will he say the same about them? It's a transurrection. Get the FBI to all these absolute lunatics. It isn't a right of yours to sterilize and butcher children. For example, I get a ton of comments and DMs after my video about the New Zealand rallies demanding that I denounce the Nashville shooter. And that I was the actual fascist for pointing out that Kelly J. Keen Mitchell, the organizer of the anti-trans rally, was stopped from studying anti-trans bigotry with violence. Again, the violence in question being tomato juice in her hair. I even got some DMs and comments that claimed that I was indirectly responsible for the violence in Nashville. That I was the one who had called for and stoked it, even indirectly. How absolutely awful to say that. Even further, these narratives are pushed through even further disinformation surrounding events like this, such as this image that was spread of Kelly J. Keene Mitchell that seems to have a knife being put to her throat, when in actuality that is a photo of a phone being held near her neck by someone who was actually her supporter. There's also another clear stark example of this in how anti-trans news outlets have shown this footage of Senator Linda Thorpe, Victoria, Australia's first indigenous woman senator, coming up to speak at Keen Minchel's rally against Keen Minchel's bigotry. The stated goal of Keen Minchel's rally is that women are allowed to come up to her microphone and speak. However, we typically find that Keen Minchel does not allow trans supportive people to speak, despite her platform being let women speak. As Senator Thorpe came up to the mic, she was tackled by police. Keen Minchel's Twitter account tweeted this video of that moment, also stating, Further footage showing Senator Thorpe rushing towards Posey Parker. Thankfully, her security guards stopped a possibly physical attack from happening. The police had no option but to pull her down. And the video that is shared on this Twitter feed is deliberately cut off to, to make it appear that Thorpe is a large, angry woman coming up to attack the poor, defenseless Posey Parker. However, the full video does show that Thorpe did not assault Parker and that Thorpe herself was violently assaulted by the security guards and police in protection of Keen Minchel, showcasing how state power is not on the side of trans people and our accomplices, as well as how violence is often enacted upon trans supported people, often in much greater measures than the trans people who are just trying to speak up for ourselves and push back against hate. But all this does not stop people from using this moment to frame trans people and our allies as the ones instigating the violence in these moments. This video has been used to try to disingenuously frame the trans activists at this event as the violent ones. And by the way, it is very telling that the very same night that Tucker Carlson ran his segment about the trans shooter in order to vilify all trans people as terrorists, he also had a segment just after it where he had Kelly J. Keene Mitchell herself on his program to say basically what I've been talking about, that trans people are the bullies, that we are the dangerous terrorists. Despite the fact that Kelly J. Keene Mitchell herself was the one stoking the violence and literally working with neo-Nazis. Was it as awful as that video suggests it was? I genuinely feared for my life. I thought I was gonna be crushed to death or stomped to death. Um, women got injured, uh, somebody got their foot broken. Uh, it was absolutely just carnage. I mean, this is the picture of extremism here. You're trying to have a conversation as a woman speaking to other women without being shouted down. I think you're taking a, an inherently moderate, pro-human, traditional <laughs> position. The people around you look like crazed and dangerous extremists. Is that what it felt like? Yeah, absolutely. The authoritarian left um, has has finally peaked and now we can all see what exactly that might look like. And it looks like Auckland in New Zealand and it's... It's scary as hell. 
This is not a narrative exclusive to physical violence, though, but whenever trans people or our allies speak up about trans rights issues. Take, for example, how writers at the New York Times recently signed a letter speaking up about the anti-trans disinformation being written about in the New York Times articles, something I spoke about in further detail in this video on my secondary channel. The New York Times itself, instead of recognizing this problem, has instead cracked down on those employees who signed the letter and blamed them for causing violence against their colleagues, the ones who wrote the anti-trans disinformation that is stoking violence against trans people in the first place. Again, victim blaming and vilifying people just asking to have actual journalistic integrity and a desire to fight back against systemic violence being instigated against a marginalized group. Speaking of all of this though, another measure that some trans people are considering taking is the idea of getting guns in the face of rising state and personal violence against us to be able to defend ourselves with. Many trans people, myself included, don't really like guns or violence in general, but it is something that sadly, given the state of the world, we do have to consider. It's a very deep and difficult choice and decision that many of us wrestle with, not just around guns, but around violence generally. But again, it is something that for many trans people feel that they need to do in order to protect themselves, and understandably so. Yet, the very fact that trans people are considering this is often used to vilify trans people even further, such as, again, Taco Carlson did recently. Anti-trans rhetoric makes the trans community carry guns. Rainbow reload! They're packing heat. There'll be appendix carrying in more ways than one. Watch out. Wait a second, we thought. This is NPR, National Public Radio, suddenly telling you that actually guns are good. They're valuable tools of self-defense really against you. So there are times when guns are good, says NPR. And we thought, well, wait a second. We've been listening to NPR since... Well, click and clack the Tappet brothers, and we remember very clearly their position on guns. For example, quote, the U.S. has more guns than any other country in the world. This is the same NPR that, in between updates on the latest trans dinosaur emojis, we've been following those very carefully, routinely runs segments calling for more gun control, and not subtle ones, like the segment entitled, Many Gun Owners Support Gun Control, So Why Don't They Speak Out? Oh yeah, a lot, a lot of gun owners support gun control. Of course they do. And yet here's that same national public radio, state radio, state media, controlled by the Biden administration, encouraging people to go to the gun store immediately. But not all people, just trans people. Guns are bad, except in the hands of trans people. There's not genocide going on. There's some weird affirmative action program going on. The trans movement is targeting Christians, including with violence. Most Christian leaders in this country don't want to admit that. Admitting it might force them to take deeply unfashionable positions. But it is true, and anyone who's paying attention knows that it's true. And so, like most true things at this point, it is officially suppressed. First off, let us not forget that LGBTQ people are far more likely to be the victims of gun violence, as many statistics point out. But Tucker Carlson is quite literally calling for the removal of trans people's general ability to own guns. And while I personally believe in gun control laws for everybody, the desire to remove guns from trans people specifically and solely based upon the simple fact of us being trans is a targeted move of attempting to disarm those that you are attempting to kill and leave us defenseless. And this is sadly a story that has precedent within Nazi history as well. Gun control laws against Jewish people was often a tactic used by the Nazis. In 1931, Weimar authorities found a plan for a takeover by the then small Nazi party group that would refuse Jews food and execute Jewish folks who didn't turn in their guns in over 24 hours. This plan was written by Werner Best, who would later become a Nazi official. However, despite this, the more liberal Weimar German government passed strict gun control laws requiring a record of those who had them. When Nazis did eventually seize power, Nazis used gun records to find Jewish people who owned them and search and confiscate their weapons. Jewish people and other politically unreliable folks, according to the Nazis, were denied the ability to buy and own guns after that point. Hitler's 1938 Gun Control Act also denied Jewish people the ability to work in gun factories, while simultaneously easing gun control laws for Nazi party members. Eventually, it was ordered that Jewish property be redistributed to German citizens, and Jews were ordered to turn over all of their guns. This, by the way, is a narrative often twisted by fascists, claiming the Nazis took everyone's guns. Hitler took the guns. Stalin took the guns. Mao took the guns. Fidel okay. Castro took the guns. Hugo Chavez took the guns. And I'm here to tell you, 
1776 will commence again if you try to take our firearms. Doesn't matter how many lemmings you get out there on the street begging for them to have their guns taken. We will not relinquish them. Do you understand? And that's why you're going to fail and the establishment knows no matter how much propaganda, the republic will rise again when you attempt to take our guns. No, in actuality, the Nazis actually gave guns to more people like them and took them away from the minorities that they were targeting. All of this took place just weeks before the Night of Broken Glass. For those of you who have not heard of it, the Night of Broken Glass was an event that was set off by the shooting of a German diplomat by a Jewish living in Paris. Though evidence points to this just being the desired spark and justification for a pre-made plan on the Nazis' part. This shooting was taken by those in the Nazi government to start to justify the destruction of Jewish property. Under cover of a government search for Jewish folks owning weapons, riots were instigated and broken out, leading to 7,500 Jewish stores and businesses and nearly 300 synagogues being destroyed, either by Nazis who were ordered to use extreme measures against Jewish folks, as well as German citizens who had been radicalized to view Jews as the enemy. Propaganda Minister Joseph Goebbels gave a speech that said, The Fuhrer has decided that demonstrations should not be prepared or organized by the party, but insofar as they erupt spontaneously, they are not to be hampered. The name Night of Broken Glass comes from the broken glass of Jewish homes, hospitals, businesses, and synagogues. At least 91 Jewish folks were killed, though that number may be much higher. Heinrich Himmler himself declared any Jewish person owning a firearm was to be sent to 20 years in a concentration camp, including even veterans who owned old rusty pistols from their time in World War I. Even those Jewish folks who willingly turned in their guns were sent to concentration camps, where many would never leave. As this clearly shows, using targeted gun control laws against a specific group is an intentional part of a genocide attempt. And it is by no means sadly surprising that a shooting done by a member of said group was used to instigate the rounding up of people and violence being done against them, all under the auspices of gun control laws. I am all for gun control laws generally. We need tighter gun control laws, but there's a difference between that and targeting a specific group who is currently under attack by state power for being members of that group for gun control legislation. We can already see this narrative being spun of trans people being violent and thus needing specific legislations against us being spun. Further, we can already see the false viewing of transness as an inherent mental illness being used to justify the removal of weapons from trans people generally. Constantly cite mental health connections of the Nashville shooter or assertions that the shooter was autistic, which is a common anti-trans talking point to vilify both autistic people, neurodivergent people, and trans people as mentally ill, as evidence of the mental illness of not just the shooter, but of trans people generally. And builds upon the narrative of trans people being inherently medicalized to justify the disarming of trans people specifically under the auspices of us being mentally ill. It's the confluence of the two ongoing right-wing narratives that it's just mental health that's the problem that causes mass shootings, as well as the narrative that trans people are ourselves mentally ill being combined in order to justify trans people's rights to guns being taken away. You can see this framing currently in the ongoing situation involving one Kayla Denker, a trans woman who filmed a video a month ago showing her handling her weapon and talking about using it to defend herself from transphobes. But now Newsweek and the Daily Mail printed libelous stories about her stating that she filmed the video after the Nashville shooting and are using it to frame a trans woman as a lunatic and dangerous, which online right-wing spaces have taken and run with. Another trans lunatic showing off her gun. Why are these mentally ill people not locked up in a psychiatric facility? The hypocrisy is so clear. As if these same folks wouldn't cheer on a photo or a video of someone doing the exact same thing as Kayla, saying that they're going to take down the liberal government. But when a trans person does it, they're a lunatic who needs to be locked up in some sort of facility. One would wonder if they would like trans people to be put into a camp of some sort. Again, to be clear, this is not me being a Second Amendment supporter, but just to point out how gun control laws are wielded specifically against specific marginalized groups. But since we're speaking about guns and the Second Amendment and the causes of mass shootings, let's talk about the motivations of mass shootings a little bit. I spoke about in other videos about recent mass shootings like the shooter in Buffalo, New York, or the Club Q Colorado Springs shooter, which are both horrific acts. However, as I spoke about in those videos, both of those shootings were politically motivated, as they were attempts by the shooters to target a marginalized groups, going out of their way, sometimes miles out of their way in the case of the Buffalo shooter, to find a minority group community in order to target. 
and especially in the case of the Buffalo Shooter, left behind manifestos that stated that they were doing this because they believed in the white replacement theory. Yet the reasons they had these political motivations and they chose these marginalized communities to target was that these shooters themselves were angry, isolated, and frustrated at feeling like they were failing men not living up to who they were supposed to be and taking that anger out in violent ways on the minority groups that they felt were the cause of that isolation, anger, and frustration because they had been told so by people in power. People like Matt Walsh or Tucker Carlson or politicians constantly calling LGBTQ people groomers or stoking white supremacist narratives. It does mention the so-called great replacement theory. And this is what's being, this is, this is what they're trying to hang around the neck of uh, Tucker Carlson, Fox News, really any conservative, myself included. Um, because Tucker Carlson and other conservatives have in the past pointed out that the Democrats have been very open about the fact that, you know, they want to have, they, they want to minimize what they call whiteness in America. And they want to bring in voters, you know, from other countries. They don't want voter ID laws. You know, they don't want to, they want to bring, be able to bring in the voters and, and have them vote because they know they're going to be voting Democrat. So they want to replace, especially white male voters with voters who they think are going to be beholden to them. Now, this isn't a conspiracy theory. Um, there's nothing wild or speculative about it. It's just a fact. I know that the left and all the little gatekeepers on Twitter become literally hysterical if you use the term replacement, if you suggest that the Democratic Party is trying to replace the current electorate, the voters now casting ballots, with new people, more obedient voters from the third world. But they become hysterical because that's that's what's happening, actually. Let's just say it. That's mm. true. I have less political power because they're importing a brand new electorate. Why should I sit back and take that? To say that these were the reasons that many men don't feel like they are able to get ahead in society. And I spoke about more specifically that form of stochastic terrorism in this video. And it doesn't stop at mass shootings. We see similar acts of terrorism and violence against things like drag shows in the United States, being propped up by the anti-trans and anti-drag narratives that are being put into media as well as legislations. Such as the recent attempt by a Proud Boy to attack a drag show. And going back to my earlier point, that drag show was protected by people literally beating the crap out of the Proud Boy, as well he deserved to be. These constant attacks of physical violence, by the way, are also incidentally part of why some trans people feel a need to arm themselves. But again, we're seen as the instigators because stochastic terrorism allows separation and deniability between those enacting violence and those stoking it, while trans people are only able to arm ourselves for ourselves. But these mass shooters and violent enactors targeting marginalized groups are often, like I said, men who feel like they cannot live up to the ideal of manhood they're supposed to have, feeling like they're failing in some way and taking it out on a marginalized group. Take, for example, the Colorado Springs shooter's father, who stated that he was more worried that his son might have been gay than he was about the fact that he committed a mass shooting. When you leave what happened, they start telling me about the incident, about the incident. There was a shooting involving, you know, there multiple people. Right. And then I go on, they were on going to find it's a, a gay bar. Yeah, right. And, and, and I was like, oh my god, is he gay? As a scare, like, oh my god, shit, is he gay? Hmm. And he's not gay, so it's like this. It's, it's, well, you guys had had conversations about that. You, you were, oh yeah, so like, you, you, I was you adamant. Told him, yeah, you were adamant that gay is, gay adamant, is bad. Yeah. I'm adamant, I'm adamant, I'm a Mormon, I'm a, a conservative Republican, and we don't do gay, we don't do yeah. gay, we don't do gay. Yeah. Yet we see a similar motivation with all mass shootings, not just the terrorist politically motivated ones. Mass shootings are often carried out by those who are isolated, frustrated, bullied, and feel less than others because they don't measure up to some societal standard. Whether that be from the institutions or the individuals in their life who are upholding this view of manhood or personhood that they're supposed to exist up to. While many of these mass shooters may not have direct political aims like the Buffalo or Colorado Spring shooters, they do feel that same nihilism. The only difference is who they act that violence out upon. For most mass shooters, it is the schools or institutions or people where they were bullied and mistreated. And again, I want to be very clear. Fuck these shooters. While I understand where they come from, I am not saying that it was okay or justifying their acts of violence by any means. 
But one thing that I point out about them, and I have said in numerous other videos, is that while we can hold people accountable for the harm they've done and say fuck them and fight them, it's important to realize that they are also products of a system that will continue to create people just like them over and over and over and over again. We live in a society and system where often cis white men, though not exclusively cis white men, feel like they can't live up to some ideal of manhood and who they're supposed to be, and thus react violently because violence is how we teach men to be able to handle their emotions. That violence is an appropriate way to enact your will upon the world when you are feeling upset or frustrated or can't articulate your feelings. It's not that these folks were more inclined towards violence by their nature, but that the only outlet for emotions that we teach them is violence. And then when they're unable to push back against the system that caused them these feelings of anger and isolation, or sometimes being unable to even recognize that these systems exist, they lash out at those who they see as the individual people or institutions who caused them so much pain and trauma. And this is not exclusive to cis white men, though it is often more the case with cis white men who feel like they should be living up to some version of manhood in our society today. But the same can happen for trans people, and potentially may have happened with the Nashville shooter. Again, this is not to say that we shouldn't say fuck them for the horrific actions. Fuck them. But we can hold these two truths in our head. That these people are terrible, and that we have a system that will continually create these terrible people who will feel similarly and repeatedly make the same choices. I mean, the very fact that we have so many mass shootings over and over and over again in this country showcases that very fact. It's not that Americans are somehow more innately violent, but something about the system and society in which we set up creates people like this, who feel like this is their recourse. And by the way, I don't just say this about mass shooters, but many who cause violence. I recently said the same about fascists and turfs in my video last week. They are products of a system that will always create people like them. But that does not mean that we don't denounce individuals' horrific actions or beliefs and fight them. But we also need to realize that we need to fight the systemic causes as well, or else this will keep happening and keep getting worse. We need to fight for further gun laws, or against the rampant anti-trans bigotry in our society, the racism in our society, the anti-Semitism in our society, or the capitalist forces that make people feel like they constantly have to work but are never able to be enough or able to support themselves. And hell, while this is complete supposition on my part, as we don't know for sure yet, at least as of the time of this video, I wouldn't be surprised if at least part of the reason the Nashville shooter chose to enact violence against the school that this shooter attended was because of that school's potential denial of the shooter's trans identity. What we can see is often the case in many schools generally who aren't trans accepting. In fact, the shooter Instagram messaged a friend before the shooter went to commit their mass shooting talking about how the shooter was feeling depressed, and that the mass shooting was their way to try to die by suicide by cop. Again, this is not to condone nor give these shooters' actions legitimacy. Just because they suffered a trauma does not mean that it is okay or right for them to enact violence upon the innocent, especially children. But it does paint and inform them as part of a system that continually does this to people, with some feeling the need to deal with this ongoing systemic trauma with yet more violence against the innocent. Again, all that is supposition on my part for the Nashville shooter, but was definitely the case with the transgender Aberdeen shooter. A friend of the Aberdeen shooter said she struggled since early in high school with severe depression, partially connected to her feelings of not being accepted when she first came out as a gay teenage girl and later as transgender. Yet, these systems are the way that people in power want them because it serves their narratives of mental illness, or their ability to stoke stochastic terrorism with plausible deniability, or to vilify marginalized groups like trans people. Right-wing pundits and politicians always argue that mental health is the cause of mass shooters. They argue that it is always the individual's fault solely and only, and that there's nothing we can do about that fact. It's just something core to who those people are. Kid, I was going to call him a kid, but he's 18, year old, 18 years old. This man's ideology is a mess. It's just all, he's, again, a lunatic all over the place. Um, he does mention the so-called great replacement theory. And this is what's being, this is, this is what they're trying to hang around the neck of uh, Tucker Carlson, Fox News, really any conservative, myself included. And they also stigmatize all trans people as mentally ill. This is the promise that it's liberation and this is kids when they finally express their true inner identity will be happier and better adjusted. But the incidence of violence and mental illness seems to be extraordinary. So it doesn't seem like people are being liberated. It seems like people are being tormented and driven to, driven to the brink of insanity. That just watching, that seems clear. 
It's the exact opposite of liberation. We have mountains of evidence that people who suffer from gender dysphoria also suffer from very high rates of um, mental health comorbidities. Um, when you have this reality on top of people being fed cross-sex hormones and yeah. are also being in an environment where they are encouraged to have a violent hatred of wider society, and you can see, see this in the reaction before, during, and after this, uh, this killing. Andy, no. And they also frame trans people as an ideology, not a people, being pushed by the liberal elites or Joe Biden or the medical establishment or George Soros, linking anti-Semitic conspiracy theories to all this as well. But Joe Biden is lying about that. He knows that he's lying, and you know that he's lying. Yesterday's massacre did not happen because of lax gun laws. Yesterday's massacre happened because of a deranged and demonic ideology that is infecting this country with the encouragement of people like Joe Biden. Thus, when a trans person commits a mass shooting, it is easy for these pundits and politicians to link all of these things, blaming all trans people as inherently violent because we're quote-unquote mentally ill, and that Democrats and the liberal elite, and sometimes dog-whistling about Jewish people, as the cause of this dangerous ideology. He's an enemy of the state. You want to know the truth? The enemy of the state is him and the group that control him, which is circling around him. Do this, do that, Joe. You're going to do this, Joe, right? Now, you'll notice, uh, shockingly, that these LGBT groups are mysteriously silent about these kinds of concerns after shootings by white supremacists. I mean, they're more than happy for those manifestos to be published, and they always are. But in this case, they caution against it. The only mildly surprising thing about this is that they, they haven't really bothered to come up with a plausible excuse for this glaring inconsistency and hypocrisy. Instead, they essentially confess to the truth. They want the discussion around the shooting to remain focused on a politically useful issue like gun control. Don't tell us why this happened, they cry. Uh, you know, that'll make it more difficult for us to use the tragedy for political gain. Most of all, they're desperate to protect their victim narrative. I mean, this is their most potent political weapon. And uh, more than that, it is the foundation of their entire ideology. They must protect at all costs the hallucinatory notion that LGBT people, and in particular trans people, are oppressed and marginalized. And you know they're the ones being targeted, not the other way around. But they are using this narrative to distract from the real causes of mass shooters. The real cause is ultimately a society that constantly forces people to try to live up to some ideal of manhood or womanhood that they could never live up to in a capitalist system that makes them feel scared and unable to provide for themselves and which fosters resentments not at the system that made itself so ubiquitous that it feels invisible, but to those around them. But those in power will use this frustration and anger to try to have communities target each other to prop up this narrative and stoke infighting, often towards a marginalized group like trans people, so that we ignore that the system will constantly create people like this over and over and over again. Guns are just fuel on that fire that allow more even horrific violence to be enacted. And to be clear, we need more gun control now. But even gun control is a band-aid and a much larger systemic issue. As Nazi Germany shows us, even well-meaning gun control laws enacted by a neoliberal system capable of falling into fascism can then be twisted by the fascists to target minorities in their desire for endless death, genocide, and war. Our real issue is that this system will continually generate violent people acting out their self-worth and isolation frustrations. All of this showcases the blatant dehumanization, hypocrisy, and desire to fit a narrative that all of this anti-trans rhetoric supports. In fact, let's briefly talk about some of the hypocrisy in these narratives that are very clear in showcasing the anti-trans hate. Many news outlets in the hours after the shooting mistakenly labeled the Nashville shooter as a trans woman in their headlines and reporting. Many just heard that a trans person potentially committed an act of violence, which by the way, at the point that many of these articles went up, the fact that this person was trans was also not confirmed, and just assumed that this person must have been a trans woman. This should showcase the lack of journalistic integrity in journalistic outlets like Sky News, but it also showcases their very clear anti-trans bias that they are using to fit a narrative. Before the shooting, these news sites had constantly featured stories of trans women being more inherently violent due to trans women being male. 
The false idea of men being more inherently violent by nature of being men, and trans women being framed as men in these publications' eyes, fitting with many anti-trans rhetorics of the violent, dangerous trans women who are coming to attack your children in the bathrooms or who are sexual perpetrators trying to assault women. We saw a very similar falsehood spread very recently by J.K. Rowling on Twitter. False statistics to again frame trans women as inherently violent, often sexually. To be able to get the statistical numbers that J.K. Rowling is citing in this tweet on screen, to showcase that trans women are inherently more violent just by the nature of being trans women, she has to include sex work in those statistics. Sex work being something that trans women are often forced into to be able to pay our bills due to the larger systemic discriminations that we face and also showcasing the anti-sex work viewpoint of many who also espouse anti-trans viewpoints. Yet, this is the narrative that many want to push, that trans women are more inherently violent by nature of being trans women because we are male. Alternatively, trans men, usually young trans men, are often seen in these rhetorics as women, which they are not, who have been tricked into gender ideology, infantilizing them. Interesting that when, when it comes to the transgender phenomenon, you know, uh, Certainly for right now, for adolescents who fall into it, the vast majority are girls. All of this goes to uphold the idea that women are weak and needing of protection from authoritative strong men, and that these strong men should enact violence against trans women in order to protect, quote unquote, real women. Um, had a bit of an idea about some of the things that you can do, and men, for once, I'm talking to you. I'm talking about you dads who maybe carry, I think that's what you say, uh, I'm so down with the American lingo, maybe you carry, maybe you don't, uh, maybe you consider yourself a protector of women, maybe you're that sort of man, um, maybe you have a daughter or a mother or a wife, uh, maybe you have a sister, maybe you just have some friends, maybe you just think women are human and you don't need any absolute connection with them to feel compelled to protect us. Um, I think you should start using women's toilets, men. In fact, in some places in United Kingdom law, as well as in United States law, it's sometimes seen as not legally possible for women to be able to sexually assault anyone, which is not the case. Though women are less likely to be the perpetrators of sexual violence, they can be. But it all goes again to framing women as needing to be protected by the dangerous minority groups, as well as framing trans women as men in order to dehumanize us and frame us as inherently more aggressive as well as upholding authoritarian rhetorics of a strong man needing to come and save you. And this biased thinking of trans women as being inherently more violent automatically assumed that the person enacting violence in Nashville was a trans woman. But now, after it was confirmed that it was a potential trans man who did the attack in Nashville, the narrative in many of these spaces has shifted to that it was testosterone that caused the shooter to enact violence. When you pump a woman full of testosterone, you don't get a rational man. You get the same emotional woman with male aggression, a feeling creature with no wall of reason to contain the monsters in her id. This utilizing of the idea of it being testosterone that causes this person to enact violence is again going to the same idea that men are more likely to enact violence, while also combining it with the misogyny of a woman being irrational. But it showcases the hypocrisy of their point of view, because if that's the case, if testosterone is the reason that this trans man went to enact more violence and was more likely to enact violence in their eyes, then doesn't that also mean that trans women would be less likely to be violent because we take estrogen? It showcases how many of these narratives and journalistic institutions who prop up anti-trans hate are more focused on the narrative of being against trans people than they are against actual good journalism and actually having a coherent point of view, while also upholding traditionalist gender binary thinking. And while I shouldn't need to go into this, it's important to point out that some research has shown that while there may be a temporary increase in aggression when people take testosterone, it actually levels out pretty quickly and that actual research has found that aggression rates decrease in the long term. But again, hate isn't logical, it's quite literally based in illogic. Never believe that anti-Semites are completely unaware of the absurdity of their replies. They know that their remarks are frivolous, open to challenge but they are amusing themselves, for it is their adversary who is obliged to use words responsibly, since he believes in words. The anti-Semites have the right to play. They even like to play with discourse, for, by giving ridiculous reasons, they discredit the seriousness of their interlocutors. They delight in acting in bad faith, since they seek not to persuade by sound argument, but to intimidate and disconcert. If you press them too closely, they will abruptly fall silent, loftily indicating by some phrase that the time for argument is past. 
And by the way, it also should be mentioned that I couldn't find confirmation anywhere that the Nashville shooter even took testosterone. So they just assume that a trans man takes testosterone just by the nature of them being a trans man. To be very clear, not every trans man takes testosterone. Sometimes it's because they may not want to take testosterone, which is perfectly legitimate, or because they can't get access to testosterone or can't afford it through their healthcare systems that often misunderstand or deny trans people access to healthcare, or may live in a state that is passing anti-trans legislation that denies them access to trans-affirming care. But this also goes to show how many of these institutions and anti-trans narratives always assume that a trans person must be medicalized, because they only see transness as a mental illness needing some form of cure. Which is, again, more fascism stuff. Curing a minority. There are many trans people who are all validly transgender who seek no form of medical intervention to help them feel happier in their own bodies. All of this is constantly used to frame trans people as the villains and uphold authoritarian power over and over and over again, and they continually dehumanize trans people and use us for their ends, leaving, quite literally, our bodies behind. And this dehumanization goes so far that people are actively cheering on a trans person's death. Many anti-trans folks are using transphobic language over the images of the police footage of the Nashville shooter's dead body. And the fact that they are using transphobia in order to celebrate this person's death show that they are not taking glee at the death of a shooter who committed horrific violence, but just the mere fact that a trans person is dead. And their excitement at having permission to showcase their anti-trans hate publicly because the shooter is a person that no one in our society feels is worthy of empathy. Thus, they feel that they can get away with their transphobia because anyone who points out that they're being transphobic pieces of shit, that they can just throw back at that person that, oh, you care about the shooter? You must defend the shooter's actions. It's gross and disgusting. But, uh, even though the shooter murdered children, that doesn't mean that we get to use grammatically correct pronouns in reference to her. Well, well actually it does. In fact, we get to use grammatically correct pronouns about people even if they don't commit mass shootings. The mass shooting gives us permission to say lots of other things about her, that she was a monstrous, bloodthirsty, murdering, worthless piece of garbage, for example. But as for the pronouns, we get to uh, do that regardless. Actually, listen to this. Check this out. This is going to shock you. We get to say whatever we want to or about her or you or anyone else. That's what we get to do. What you don't get to do is control our words or our minds. I can say whatever I want about anyone, and I will. And I can say whatever I want about any trans person, and I will. They do not get to dictate anything to me. That's what they don't get to do. I talk about them according to how I see them and what I think about them, and according to what is actually true. I don't talk about them according to how they see themselves. I am using the filter of my own mind and of reality. I am not using the filter of their minds. That's the way that this works. And for many of them, I would not be shocked if they have this same amount of glee at the death of any trans person, regardless of what that trans person had done. But it's just with this trans person's death, they have a ready excuse to be able to showcase their glee at a trans person's body. And all of this leads to the final aspect that I wish to discuss. The emotional effect of all of this on trans people. Because it's fucked up that trans people not only have to feel the pain that everyone feels when a shooting like this happens, the pain that we feel because we are human, the pain that I feel of knowing that three children are dead, but as soon as we hear that a trans person committed this violence, all trans people, we all instantly know at the same time that now, while we are feeling all of this grief and pain, we are now going to have to defend our very identity due to someone else's horrific actions, from bigots using this shooter's identity to justify hate against us. Every time that something like this happens, this is the emotional train that trans people go through. We see the news of the shooting or violence and of children dying, and our heart breaks as every other person's heart breaks at hearing news like that. It destroys us. And then in that moment, when we hear that a trans person did it, we feel everything 
the weight of everything that I just talked about fall upon us, on our souls. Before we even see it happen, we know that anti-trans ghouls will use this event to vilify all of us and try to justify further violence against us. Because we know that's what their goal is. We know that it's going to happen. Hell, as soon as I heard that a trans person had done a mass shooting in Nashville, I didn't even need to look online to know that people were already cheering on this person's death and using transphobia to push for even further hate. Some trans people may not be able to articulate everything that I just said. They might not be able to sit down and be able to go through all of that, nor should they be able to in a moment of such deep pain. But we sure as hell fucking feel the despair, rage, fear, and exhaustion that knowing that we're going to have to defend our very existence while handling grief brings upon us. And that, by the way, is also a goal of all of this to tire trans people and other marginalized folks out, to make us feel like we have no hope, to make us feel like we should give up, to kick us when we are emotionally gutted, not to mention already tired from the endless fighting we've had to do in our personal and professional and political lives to fight against anti-trans bigotry and hate. And all of this robs us of the ability to have a moment to mourn or even be able to live our lives as full human beings. I know so many of my trans friends, myself included, who had to go and do work the day of the shooting and just had all of this extra burden on top of them. And we aren't human during any of it. It's like dragging ourselves through hot coals every day, just trying to do our best. And we see all of this occurring. We see the dehumanization and the bigotry. And we don't know how to respond because we want to say, fuck you, you transphobic pieces of shit. After all, we see things like the celebrating of a trans person's death or the intentional misgendering and the dehumanization going on. But we know that if we express that rage without having a huge long hour long video essay behind it, we'll be vilified further. For people will say, oh, well, you didn't condemn the shooter. You're going after people like Tucker Carlson. You must think that the shooting was okay because they're trans and they're on your side. That's why I've had to be so clear at the start of this video about saying, fuck the shooter. And even then, I bet there will be comments in this video that will say, well, Jesse, this is where your trans terrorist ideology leaves. You are the real fascist, you groomer pedo freak. Or some variation or dilution upon that theme bitterness and a self-fulfilling prophecy, which is a demonic prophecy, which drives them to the gates of hell and human life has zero value. And you saw it in the Me Too movement. I said, it's not a Me Too movement. It's a me movement. Yeah. This is why my pronouns, mm -hmm. how you need to announce me and acknowledge me and tomorrow it may change because they're so empty. There's such a void and a chasm. Yes, it's a mental illness, but let's go further. It's demonic possession. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. To slaughter children is not just a mental illness. Mm -hmm. It is a cocktail of Satan having a foothold celebrated by society, by pastors that are now saying trans is holy. No, it's not. We had it on the show. Sure. And this is the result, Sarah. Mm -hmm. So here's what happened yesterday. Children died because of the LBGTQ trans crazy movement. You did this. You drive your own people off a cliff because if you love them, you would get them help. Mm -hmm. And on that topic though, all trans people, while we are dealing with all this, are asked to publicly come forward and condemn the trans shooter. Despite cis men never being asked to go out of their way to condemn cisgender men shooters. There is an underlying assumption that trans people are seen as supportive of mass murder if a trans person did it until said otherwise. Again, it all goes to this belief, sometimes conscious, sometimes unconscious, that trans people are bullies and hateful. The stigma against us. Rather than just seeing us as who we actually are. People who just want to live. People who just want to love. People who just want to thrive. Being honest, on a personal level, I'm exhausted. As many of you know, I put out those last two videos about the stuff going on in Australia and New Zealand, and those were videos that I didn't intend to make, but I felt like I needed to. 
And I was doing those videos on top of the other stuff that I'd be doing. I mean, quite literally this week, I was only planning to work on my short film that I'm working on, as well as some bigger videos that I'm excited about uh, that are coming on this channel that don't feel mired in this anti-trans bullshit. That feel like something constructive and, and hopeful. And I know I should focus my energy on that more constructive, hopeful content, but I just feel a need to use my platform and energy to fight back against all of this hate because we are in the midst of a genocide attempt. And I sit here conflicted about how I must do something because I, I have the privilege and platform to be able to. But I'm exhausted and tired And now I know as I perform this, I'm quite literally going to have to spend the rest of my day editing this video, possibly working into the night so that I can get it out in a timely manner. And that just freaking exhausts me. And I just wish I could have spent today doing what I had wanted to do, which was to be on a podcast talking about the Star Trek and then spending the rest of my day editing a video that I'm really excited about while also dealing with short film stuff. Stuff that I was excited about, but nope, this is my day now. I also know that it's going to open up a new comment section on my channel that I know will be filled with a lot of love, but also will lead to more hate being sent my way. And then on top of all of that, I also worry that I am becoming too mired in this pushing back against anti-trans hate on my channel, that this will become all my channel is. I don't want it to be. I have many things that I'm hoping to do beyond just talking about the next anti-trans bullshit. But I am worried that I, I can't focus on my art anymore. That I'll lose everything because I, I'm not creating what I wanted to. That my channel will be destroyed because I'm not focusing more generative things that my fellow peers on YouTube are able to focus on. Because they aren't in the midst of all of this. And this fear, by the way, isn't helped by the fact that every video I do on this subject is demonetized, though I'm sure folks like Fox News and The Daily Wire, places funded by millionaires, have full monetization on every video that they do about this very topic. Hell, I'm even pushing a comedy video that's already done that was supposed to release on the day that this video goes up to next week because I feel like this is more important and needed right now. And editing Jesse here, can I just say please watch that video when it goes up? Not because I want views or anything on it, but because I really desperately just want people to feel laughter or something fun from my work, rather than the emotions that I've had to put out for the last few weeks with my work. I really, really would just like to see people laugh at something that I made. It really would mean a lot, honestly. Anyways, I'm just tired editing here and really just want to see people enjoy a thing that I make and not feel sad at it because I feel sad editing this right now. Anyways, back to the video. And I'm doing all of this while I'm going to be actively vilified for trying to fight back against this hate. People say that I'm a fascist and a groomer, but even people who are less radicalized like that will say I'm a grifter or a bully or getting involved in drama. When really I'm just tired and hurt and scared. But I'm also still here, and I'm willing to fight. I want to fight, and will continue to fight. And I will make the hopeful things. I will make the things that excite me and, and bring me joy, and hopefully will do the same for you. Not in defiance of them, though it is in defiance of them, but in hopes that you all know that we can and will thrive that we are able to do so, even amongst all of this. The knowledge that we will thrive is just as, if not more important right now. And I think of all the other amazing advocates who have to use their time fighting bigots, going to speak against these hate-filled bills, or doing research and more, when they could have just lived, when they could have just thrived and lived a life of joy that is being robbed from them. I think of their strength and their power and how they inspire me. I also think about how they're being robbed of their lives in small ways, in one way or another. It's a price that I'm willing, and I know many of them are willing to pay, because it's what we need to do right now. We don't get to choose the times that we live in, because it means that we are fighting to save other people's lives who are in even more danger. But it's hard. I can tell that it's affecting my physical and mental health. Hell, I'm not even sleeping well right now. 
I wrote that section about gun control under the Nazis this very morning at 5 a.m. on my phone in bed because I couldn't sleep. I just wanted to write it out because otherwise it was just stuck in my head. I know that I'm... Lucky feels like the wrong word, but... Hafer as a trans person, at least in terms of physical location and access to medical care and a support network. Though maybe not in terms of visibility to bigots, but alas. Writing a conclusion to this video has been challenging. There's too much to encapsulate fully. We are in a trans genocide attempt. Those stoking the genocide will use a trans person who committed a horrific act of violence to justify further genocide and dehumanization. We also need to realize that the shooter who caused this violence, who, while absolutely horrible, is not indicative of all trans people. And on top of that, also realize that the shooter is a product of a system that will continually create more violent shooters, trans or cis, all in benefit of the system that itself is currently only sustaining itself on the fumes of said genocide attempt. And on top of all of this, we have to realize that it is okay that trans people are recognizing that this is happening and that we wish to be self-defensive against it. And while there is debate about what exactly that means, both internally within our own personal selves and within our community, as well as our allies, that it is a discussion we need to have and have openly right now. Though on top of that, we also need to realize that by having that conversation openly, which is necessary, will lead to us being vilified further. And on top of all of this, we need to realize that this is an emotional and physical burden, and not the least of which in that it prevents us from grieving those who are lost. The trans people who are already dying in this genocide, as well as those who died from the mass shootings, such as the three adults and three children who died in Nashville. How I've had to make this whole damn video and not be able to focus on those who were murdered and how angering and sad that is because they deserve the focus. But now is not the time for thoughts and prayers. It's the time to make sure that this never happens again, or at least fight to try to, even though we know it will. I guess I'll end on this. Trans people are angry. We are ready to defend ourselves. And we are much stronger than many people think. But we're also tired. We also need help. If you are an ally, you need to be ready to become an accomplice now. We need you to understand why we are so in danger and why we need people to stand with us. The goal of all of these rhetorics is, of course, to radicalize those in power's bases further in order to enact violence and uphold their authoritarian power. But more importantly, the goal of these rhetorics is to make those who see themselves as in the middle, as centrist, feel, at the very least, enough doubt that they will do nothing in the face of a genocide attempt. To feel unsure about whether it's the, the transes who are causing the violence or, you know, the, the people in power. And so ultimately do nothing. And that honestly is more dangerous. Because inaction ultimately helps those who are doing the harm. As the famous poem says, don't stand by when they come for us, because they may come for us first, but then one day you may look around and realize that there are fewer people by your side when you need us. We need you not to fall into the disinformation and vilification tactics meant to justify our further harm, but stand with us now. Because if you don't soon, it may be too late. It already is for some. Alrighty, everybody. Um, so, I ended this video there because I feel like that needed to be the conclusatory message of the essay itself. Um, but I wanted to say a few other things for those of you who are still around. While this video was depressing for very obvious reasons, I want to remind all of you that there is hope. I already spoke about it in my last video on this channel. You can see that there are tons of people who are ready and willing to be accomplices to show up to fight for trans people. We saw it in Australia and New Zealand very clearly recently. 
And also, I should point to the recent polls that have come out that showcase that anti-trans bigotry is not only unpopular generally in the United States, but unpopular even within right-wing spaces. So know that there are people who are at the very least willing to understand or try to understand and be empathetic to trans people, and that there are also many more people, many more than the people who would stoke anti-trans hate, who are willing to show up and fight for trans people, as trans people ourselves are willing to show up and fight for others. Remember that. And also remember, never, ever give in to despair, because that's the moment when we really lose. And while there's certainly stuff to be sad and angry and depressed about, it's not a moment for despair. There's so much yet to fight for, so much yet to live for, and so much yet that we can thrive by doing. Anyways, I'm saying all of that off the cuff, so I don't, don't really know where I'm going with it, but I, I just wanted to at least have a moment to remind everyone that there is hope out there. Don't despair. <sighs> Speaking of that, it feels weird to do the promote thing, but um, I'm just going to be clear with all of you. All of this uh, has been exhausting to me, and I am very exhausted at the idea of having to go edit this right now. Um, so I am going to take a break to um, uh, take care of myself. The video that I did have planned that was supposed to come out today, the Star Trek comedy video, that'll be coming out next week. Though it is available on Patreon and Nebula if you want to support me there. Uh, those are ways to support me uh, being able to pay my bills. Uh, thank you if you do do that and you get yourself the video early. Um, and then I do have some videos coming out in the near future. Uh, my video on uh, masculinity that'll be coming hopefully next month as well as a Star Wars video that's going to take a very long time because I was supposed to be working on it right now and this week and it's going to be a several months long project anyways. Um, so just know that some of the videos uh, are going to be probably a little bit more sporadic because I'm going to need to start self-caring more um, and also take time to rest while also working on these bigger videos. And on top of that, I also have uh, my short film that I'm working on too. So a lot of stuff coming, but I I'm just understanding that I need to better balance out my mental and physical energy and health, especially amongst all of the stuff that's going on here. So apologies if the videos become a little uh, less uh, frequent as they have been, um, but there is a good reason for it. And it is because I want to make them bigger and better and focus on the thriving stuff, but also have been constantly feeling the need to do these uh, videos on the horrible stuff. Anyways, I'm rambling at this point. Love you all, take care of yourselves, and I hope you all are living long and prospering. Hey, hey you, yeah, yeah you, you cutie patootie nerds. <laughs> cutie patootie, I'm a goddamn 1920s grandma. Anyways, thank you all you wonderful nerds who are my patrons, who allow me to do this, who allow me to do what I do. I could not do this uh, YouTube channel, I could not pay my bills, I could not support my baby Newt, my kitty Newt, without all of you, so thank you so much for all of that. And an extra special thank you to Catherine Lambeth, Carrie Ellen Foss, Joe Herman Holt, Miranda Janelle, Lily Gray, Ogisha Weiss, Mary Mello, Heather Long, El Tan Tivy, Barbie Ann Rounds, Jack McCallan, Stephen Kleinard, Quattro, Michael Wolnes, Courtney Ray Kelly, Jem Shin, Ali Gober, Alex Miller, Barbara Ruski, Randy Thompson, Matt Chung, Christian Hurst, Spooky Heather, Sylvia, Alan Altman, Super Desi, Wellington Marcus, Christine S, Britz Creek, Zach Cody, Screaming Vixen, Lily Bailey, Jessica Kimbrell, Boyd Earl, Vincent Ellington, Meadow Whisper, Felicia Tost, Chloe Dollar, Joseph Dewey, Marshall Nye, James Krivda, Gordon Alexander, Rose Connolly, Jane Slusser, Dominic Noble, Laura Runner, Zone One Librarian, Jennifer Fuss, Weirdly Beardly, Chris Bodley Dinch, Sunk Corgi, Sean McKenzie, Sonia Naroperdo, Nathaniel Fronton, Hellscape Wanderer, Jolene Cassidy, Farangato. Ooh, they kind of rhymed. Transit Toronto. Painy Coke, Rain Corkin, Wendy's Abyssal, Ryan Hunter, Spencer Brownlee, John Weatherby, Damian Rice, W. Randy Eady, Sage Corbett, Tang Wilson, Wayne L., Belinda Walters, Nisa Marie. Hopefully I said that right. I'm sorry if I didn't. Kilara Arell, Stephen Richardson, Zach Prax, Carry On, Drew Bach, Beatrix Purvis, Cyber Quaker, Jade Perissus, Kevin Frotek, Autumn Jenny, Maddie H., Matthew Carreglo, Sean Piper, Sean Sullivan, Lisa Flynn, Epsilon is Greater Than, The Mighty Ginger Joe, Duh, Devin Camerlocker, Flying Kata Dragon, Melody Ann Winters Good, Mark H. Williams Author, Sally Leslie Hutchkins, Sarah Bystem, Casual Observer, Gretchen Badger, William Stewart, Marion Herb, Jordan Long, Katie K., Patricia Crompton, Michael and Kate Hawk. Blueberry Hill, Verdix Kai, Jess Johnson, Sarah Lemero, Sky Skinner, Joe Comics, Chris Hurst, Kefis Kaiser, Laura Demero, Kurt Mullen, Becky Sparks, Nathan Steele, Mick Sophus, Joe Heoresis, 
Josh just wants in blue. Celestial Dawn, Leah the Void, Troy Stull, Jason Knott, Zumila Kincaid, Jordy Lisero, Tony the DC Nerd, the Tipsy Changeling. Maeve, Luna T, Zophiel L, Grumpy Dragon 75, Nikki Gordon, Bloomfield, Crit Back, Strawberry Pop Tart, Kalis, Shield Maiden 4444, Fox E, Adam RDL Taylor, Kingy, Alexandra Lombach, It's a Bug, Not a Feature, Ulrich Bogdan, Barbara Borges, Abigail Marie, James Hodge, Corey and Vale, Honkinen. Mwah. Love you all. You're amazing. Take care of yourselves, my friends. You dorks.